Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to my extremely ill-advised 2024 library tour. <laughs> we are still in, in the kitchen. We are on bookcase number four. Yesterday, we managed to get uh, two shelves done because one of the shelves was almost entirely the same thing. It was a big, helpful block. And I would like to get two more shelves done. I'd like to finish this bookcase today. But the next uh, two shelves, there are no blocks at all, <laughs> none whatsoever. So we'll try to go through at a, at a fairly good clip. Uh, so the first one is this uh, Modern Library edition of Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. This with the uh, the cover of a, an A&E BBC miniseries that I really, really enjoyed. I really liked this miniseries. Uh, but uh, it doesn't belong, this is going to be a refrain throughout these two shelves, I think. It doesn't belong here. I think this bookcase, I was, I think I was probably just using this as some sort of sorting shelf. Uh, Tom Jones is a Western canon classic, and I want to create a bookshelf for those. Uh, then we have an anthology. This is uh, five novels of Lawrence Block. I don't know about great, <laughs> but there's this five novels of Lawrence Block uh, that I got just recently and dipped into a bit. I have not read everything in it. Then another recent acquisition. A lot of these will probably be recent acquisitions. This is The Voyage of the Narwhal uh, by Andrea Barrett. Uh, historical novel that uh, came up on this channel because uh, somebody in the comments field asked me, uh, have you read question? They asked me, have you ever read this book? Uh, okay, then Too Loud a Solitude by Bohemond Mold Rommel. Uh, Rommel is great, and I think this is probably my favorite book of his, unless it's I Serve the King of England, but I think it's probably this one. Uh, maybe that's just because of its bookish concentration. Uh, then we have two uh, historical adventure slash espionage novels, uh, the India Black novels. Uh, I found both of these a few months ago in the spring. Uh, I reviewed them. I reviewed at least one of them uh, eons ago. I, I'm, I'm never going to remember to find a link <laughs> to that down below. Uh, I reviewed at least one of these. I really enjoyed them both. Uh, and have I found these two, and I mean to go, you know, to reread them again, but in the meantime, I meant to look into whether or not there were ever any other India Black novels, especially with this this really, really good cover design. Oh, that's just a really good cover design, but but I haven't done it. I haven't checked to see if there are any more. And then we have Nora Epstein. This is uh, Nora Epstein. This is the, the, the friendly Dickens. There's a whole series, a little series of these things, the friendly universe, the friendly Jane Austen, the friendly Shakespeare. They're delightful as volumes. And this Dickens volume is different from a couple of the others in that it's a mo mainly Dickensiana rather than... I mean, you, it has lots and lots of reprints of the man's work, but there's a lot of other stuff as well. This is, this is mostly nonfiction. Uh, then we have science fiction. This is a name that will need no introduction on BookTube, George R.R. R. Martin and Lisa Tuttle. This is their book, Windhaven. I think this might have been a science fiction book club edition. I don't, don't really know. I had this as a mass market paperback once. That's how I found it originally. And I don't have the mass market paperback. I haven't seen it in decades. Uh, so when I found the hardcover, I grabbed it. Uh, this is a science fiction novel about a, a planet that is mostly just isolated archipelagos of little rocky islands. And it's pre most forms of modern technology. So there's only one way to run messages. The seas are incredibly dangerous. So there's only one reliable way to run messages between those islands. And that's a group of flyers who use scavenged bits from the seeding technology of the planet, bits that they don't particularly understand in order to, navigate the, the perilous winds between the islands. And it takes place over a number of years. It's really, really enjoyable. Uh, okay, then we have uh, Italian Journeys by William Dean Howells. This is... He did... Uh, Howells did a bunch of uh, travel writing when he went abroad for a political appointment. Uh, and who is this? New Point Press? Uh... That no, says Marble Travel. Uh, yeah, Marble Travel. They did a couple of nice volumes of this. They the I have two of them: one Italian Journeys and one about his time in Howells' time in Venice. And they ought to be together. <laughs> they obviously ought to be together. Uh, 
let's keep going here. We have a work of nonfiction by Owen Jones, The Establishment and How They Get Away With It. Uh, really, really enjoyable, muckraking, quasi-historical. There is, there is our author in younger days. Of course, Owen Jones has made some sort of pact with the devil, so he doesn't look any younger. I swear. Uh, a, a ridiculously hedonistic lifestyle. And he's 40? Is he 40? Is he is he not far away from 50 and he still acts like a uh, meth head tweak party circuit boy? <laughs> Which is, I guess, if, you, if you've got the ability to do that, you might as well live your life to the hilt. But uh, believe it or not, that life has not aged him. I swear that in the last 10, 15 years, the thing that's aged him the most has been the the war in Gaza. <laughs> he seems older now. That That is really uh, taking a toll on him, I think. Uh, then we have, uh, well, this, what is this? Um, Steampunk? Dead Iron by Devin Monk. Uh, another terrific cover, a lot like those India Black covers. Uh, this is a uh, steampunk adventure, so it's intentionally anachronistic science fiction technology. But the main character is a werewolf, and that's always a plus with me. <laughs> uh, we just need to figure out, I need to figure out where it's going to go. Uh, same thing with this one. This is Aspects of Aristocracy. You know, this actually should go with the books on books section. This is David Kennedy, and I think he's fantastic. And this is just uh, collected occasional prose. Uh, slightly polished into broader sociological essays. Uh, at the very least, along with the Owen Jones book, it belongs in history. It belongs with, uh, around the corner with the history books. I don't know how we're going to round that corner on this library tour. I have no idea. <laughs> we'll have to, I'll have to figure it out. Uh, then we have Jack Rudlow. This is Time of the Turtle. Popular natural history from Penguin about turtles. Uh, not all turtles, not even a fraction, but a lot of good segments on turtle evolution and turtle biology. Uh, okay, then this is William Zink. This is Eddie and Julia. Just a work of contemporary fiction about two young lovers, one of whom has a fa uh, an odd, for his age group, heart condition. Uh, I liked it. I liked it. Uh, that's that's all, though. I, I, I don't know why... I kept it. I don't know why I have this, but uh, but I guess that's the whole point of of shelf tours, right? Is that you don't know, you, you figure out as you go along. Okay, then we have Rohinton Mystery. This is uh, a fine balance in an uh, a UK trade paperback. So this is now two copies of this that we've seen: a mass market paperback and a trade paperback. Neither one American. A, a big, uh, multi-layered Indian novel that I thought was really, really good. Uh, we okay, have bad science fiction. Good, bad science fiction is so bad, it's good. <laughs> this is John Ringo, Gust Front. A giant pos lean lizard soldier on the cover there. <laughs> I've had this thing as mass market paperback, but I got rid of it along with all the rest of these Bane things. Uh, and then the hardcover showed up at the Brattle Bookshop, so, uh, so I grabbed it for no discernible reason. <laughs> uh, and that is that shelf. So we're doing, we're not doing bad at all. Let's move on, see if we can get the whole of this bookcase done. So here we have Philip Ording. This is uh, 99 Variations on a Proof. I tried really hard to understand this book. I really did. I, I think, sometimes I think that I actually almost got it. A couple of these things, it's tremendously engagingly done. Just tremendously so. So it's not the author's fault. <laughs> I didn't get it. It's not the author's fault. Uh, then we have Kenneth Breisch. This is Henry Hobson Richardson and the Small Public Library in America. An oversized paperback, heavily heavily illustrated, showing uh, Richardson the architect. In, he did a lot of little libraries that are dotted all throughout, well, the eastern half of America, but also mo a lot of them in the northeast, in the New England. And they're all marvels. In their own way, they're all marvels. The more you study a, an original Richardson library, the more you realize how much thought went into every little detail. Not just the appearance of the details, but their function. How, how are his stone buildings ventilating themselves? Just on their own. How are they managing their own intake of sunlight? 
fascinating. This is a really good book. Uh, okay, this is something we saw just recently, Our Amazing Birds, uh, illustrated bird guide that uh, I just recently got. Uh, I guess I guess I'm right. I guess I just threw it on the shelf because this is a collect-all thing. Uh, same thing with this. This is The Geese Fly High by Florence Page Jocks. Another illustrated bird book. This is... This is also an illustrated bird book. So those two are together, but they are just a fraction of my illustrated bird books. So eventually all the illustrated bird books should be together. Uh, okay, then we have uh, uh, a Loeb Classical Library Edition. Boy, this does not belong here any more than that Horace book did yesterday. This does not belong here. This is uh, Livy. This is books 23 to 25 of his History of Rome from the founding of the city. Uh, in these Loeb Classical Library editions, you get the English, an English language translation on one side and the Latin or the Greek on the other side. Uh, with a uh, built-in bookmark? Yes? No, the Loeb's don't have one. No. Uh, they have, they'll have a pro forma introduction, pretty good notes, and that the translation in the Loeb is usually not anything to write home about. It usually has no art at all in it, but is as close to accurate as it can get. And, but invaluably, for... Forever and ever, for years and years, the, the Loeb Classical Library editions were $20 a piece. And that meant that if you wanted to have the text of Propertius or Catullus or Livy, and maybe once in a while not worry about a translator, if you just wanted to have the text, a really good, cleaned up, annotated edition of the text itself, you could go to the, to the Loeb's and get it without worrying about going to a scholarly bookstore and finding something that's 100 years old that's going to be $100. Uh, uh, then we have uh, To Criticize the Critic, uh, Critical Essays and Occasional Prose by T.S. Eliot. So this obviously does not belong here. It belongs uh, on the bookcase about books about books. Uh, who have we got here? What Dante Means to Me, that's the one that I know the best from this, but also on Ezra Pound and Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, Eliot is entirely endurable as a critic, as a nonfiction, as someone writing my line of work. He's entirely endurable. Uh, but it, this obviously does not belong here. Uh, okay, then we have Thomas Mallon. This is yours ever. A study of snail mail correspondence. All the different kinds that it could be and all the different people who were great at it. That is, this book is just a hair less excellent uh, than his other book, A Book of One's Own, about private journals, about keeping journals. I love them both, and they ought to be together. <laughs> this book clearly belongs in the little book room. Uh, oh, okay, well this is going to be probably our only brock of books this time around. These are by Abby Howard, uh, and they are uh, in a series that are... I guess technically for young adults, but I don't know of an adult that wouldn't love them. The The series is Earth Before Us. And the books are the... I have Mammal Takeover. I have Ocean Renegades. And I have uh, Dinosaur Empire. And in these books, uh, an adventurous young girl... Uh, because boys don't learn and don't have the ability to learn, right? <laughs> All right. I guess technically, biologically, they are human, but there's no sense making a book for them. <laughs> but in this book, the uh, this, these little girls want to learn about uh, whatever the subject is, whether it's whether it's you know prehistoric mammals or sea life or dinosaurs. And there is a Miss Larnan. It crops up. <laughs> She's always nearby. And she takes them on a learning journey into the past. So that so that with her they can see all of these animals while she explains them. And it's wonderful. They're just the books are just wonderful. Just absolutely wonderful. I I mean I might be momentarily offended at the Twitter politics that means that just says all teachers will be women and all students will be girls. I, I might be momentarily irritated at those kinds of Twitter politics, mainly because of the vast amount of harm that they do, real-world harm that they do. If you, if you spend 15 years 
asserting and acting as though there is a subclass of rape culture troglodytes known as men or boys, then at the end of that 15 years, you will have created that. And that's incredibly harmful. <laughs> but I can overlook that. These things are, certainly for the duration of these books, I can overlook that because they're so adorable. They're just so, so enjoyable. Uh, okay, then we have a, a trade paperback of uh, One Man's Meat uh, by E.B. White of New Yorker fame. Uh, I don't know. I love these pieces. Absolutely love them, but I shouldn't have the trade paperback of this. I, I, I will trade up the minute I see this as a hardcover at the Brattle, which I do all the time. You see uh, two of these volumes of E.B. White at the Brattle all the time. I saw one today. Uh, so, I, I mean, I love, I love his writing. I love his occasional prose, but I need to find a more durable edition than that. Okay, then we have uh, uh, indie, an indie book. This is an indie historical novel by D.K. Marley called Blood and Ink, about Christopher Marlowe. When I was uh, the U.S. and worldwide indie editor for the Historical Novel Review, I got tons and tons of indie historical, self-published historical stuff in the mail, and a large percentage of those were about Christopher Marlowe. <laughs> but this I thought was fairly good. Uh, one of the better ones. Uh, okay, then from, uh, let's see here, Mariner, we have this new paperback of the USA Trilogy by John Dos Passos. Lovely, uh, floppy thing, but without the illustrations. I've, I've been grappling with the USA. For, but this older edition, which I also found this year, uh, these old century editions, usually they're so stiff and poorly made that the cover is going to pop right off the text block. Uh, but that n not with this one. This one is just as floppy as that Mariner one, but it has uh, the illustrations all throughout. Lots of them. And I don't know. I mean, I know that doesn't affect the text, but it, it, it affects the reading experience very much so. Uh, then we have uh, Helen DeWitt. This is a reader's advanced copy of her book, The Seventh Samurai. Uh, lovely thing with uh, deckled edges. Just... Uh, Wanted to have it here in, in in the house. I have an ebook of it, but this is the exact format that I would want for this thing. I think it's a, it's a great book. Probably, uh, well, not even probably, definitely the first great novel of the twenty first century. Definitely, uh, certainly would be in that that post war canon nineteen forty five to nineteen two thousand twenty five that I always talk about. It would be, it would definitely be in there for fiction. Uh, then we have another recent acquisition. This is. Uh, Erskine Childers' Sea Writings. Erskine Childers, the, uh, the author of The Riddle of the Sands, uh, wrote about his love for the sea. He was a self-taught mariner, largely. At the beginning, he took a lot of classes, but at the beginning he was a self-taught mariner. And uh, he wrote about his love of the sea and sailing adventures, various sailing thoughts, for a couple of periodicals that no one saw. <laughs> their members, their paying, due-paying members saw those, but they were never for a wide audience. This author cared so little about most of the stuff that other authors care about. Uh, and here they're all collected. I don't know that that's ever happened again. I, I don't know that it ever happened before that. It was a joy to find it. Uh, then we have a battered green trade paperback of The Lord of the Rings. This was falling apart when I found it in a box on the sidewalk. And I, I've always wanted this cover. Uh, I want the hardcover of this. <laughs> the hardcover has this cover. And I just am never going to see it. At the Brattle, just never. Uh, we have uh, Conan the Barbarian novel. This is by Sean Moore, and it is Conan and the Grim Grey God. This is the only remainder, I believe, of a gigantic shelf of Conan books that I had once upon a time. Every once in a while, a Conan book would come out in trade paperback, and uh, I enjoyed this book, but I will be giving it a reread, probably, in the fall for Sumerian September, <laughs> with all things Conan. Then we have... Uh, this is the Thomas Johnson edition of the Complete Poems of Emily Dickinson. I wanted to read through a lot of Emily Dickinson's poetry when I was deep up to my eyeballs in her recent collection of letters. And I wanted it to be uh, an older edition of her poetry. So I was glad to find this. I think I found this for free as well. Uh, and then finally, we did it. So 20 minutes. We're done with this bookcase. That's great. Finally, we have uh, The Agony and the Ecstasy by Irving Stone in a, uh, a gorgeous 
slipcase edition that's full of illustrations. It's, it's full of the artwork that is referenced in the book. So it really is an edition of The Agony and the Ecstasy. Those of you who don't know, uh, The Agony and the Ecstasy is uh, a famous novel about Michelangelo. His artwork, his lifetime, he lived a long, long time, and uh, it takes you through all of his life. The concentration that most people think about is the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, mainly because that was the focus of a famous movie. The book talks about all kinds of artwork. So having a big, nice illustrated edition is a really self-evidently good idea. Probably not a good idea for me. I got it because I'd never seen it before and I, I was impulsive, but I, I think I would probably destroy it or hurt it really bad if I read it. It probably belongs in some better library than mine, some more careful library. Uh, but there you go. That is bookcase number four. We are done with the kitchen. Uh, so now there's going to be a bit of a pause. <laughs> I'm going to fix the kitchen uh, and repatriate all of these books that don't belong, that are somewhere where they don't belong. But then uh, I also have to figure out what I'm going to do next and how I'm going to do it. The natural progression from here is the depths of Mordor. It's the hutch on, in the wall of the living room. But it's an absolute mess. It hasn't been organized in a year, more. I don't even know where I'd put the camera, let alone let alone what I would do in that space. I'll have to figure it out. So we'll have a little bit of a pause in the library tour, but I will not forget about it. I intend to finish this in 2024. But that's it for now. Two USAs. <laughs> so I'll be back. Thank you, Booktube.